All right, folks, uh, it's just a little bit after five. I just heard from the governor's office and he'll be logging in momentarily and he may be one of the six or seven Deb Conrads that I see on the screen here in front of me. So um, bear with us. <laughs> uh, so right now I wanna introduce President Vincent Solis who has been a big supporter of WNC's higher education in prison program. And he'll take a minute to introduce the governor. Thank you, Deb. I wanna thank everybody for being with us here tonight. Uh, we're excited about having the governor with us. So what I'm gonna do is read a brief excerpt from his bio. As you all know, the governor of a state is extremely accomplished. Uh, our governor is no different. Uh, he's got a lot of accolades. So I'm gonna read some of those from his bio and then uh, turn it over to him. Uh, for some comments. We're extremely grateful for having him here. So with that said, let me read a few words, uh, a little bit about our governor. Governor Steve Sisolak was born into a working class family from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where his parents, Ed and Mary, worked to provide for their three children. Governor Sisolak inherited their blue uh, collar work ethic, working full time to put himself through school at, at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Uh, governor Sisolak then enrolled at UNLV's graduate, program, graduate studies program, where he received a master's degree in 1978. He put roots down in Las Vegas, built his own communications business, all while raising his two daughters uh, as a single father. Both his daughters attended Nevada's public school systems, and they also attended uh, the Nevada System of Higher Education schools at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where his daughter Ashley earned her law degree and Carly earned her master's degree. He was extremely motivated and passionate about education, where he continues to be a champion of education. Governor Sisolak decided to give back to the community that supported him by serving on the Nevada Board of Regents for 10 years. He's very familiar with the higher education system in the state, and he has championed education and has been an advocate for parents and students during his time as a uh, governor and as a regent. Uh, in 2008, after 10 years as a university regent, he was elected to the Clark County Commission where he served as chairman until being sworn in as the governor of the great state of Nevada. On the commission, Governor Sisolak was known as a coalition builder and a problem solver. Uh, he successfully managed the state's largest county budget and led the county through the great recession. As governor, Governor Sisolak is working to strengthen Nevada's statewide economy and diversifying our industries and working to attract new fields. Governor Sisolak, on behalf of everyone here tonight and the Western Nevada College family, we want to thank you for being with us, being an advocate uh, of, of this program, and also leading the state through a very difficult time. We appreciate your leadership and your advocacy, Governor. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Governor. I hate to tell you this, but you're on mute. <laughs> oh, now it looks like you're on mute. Could you try again? I'm sorry, folks, give us a moment to see if we can um, fix this issue. Hopefully our tech guys are seeing if they can help. Um, I did wanna add that we are very grateful for the governor um, and his support to the higher education and prison program. He actually did a tour of Northern Nevada Correctional Center. Um, boy, it's been definitely over a year ago now and met with some of our students at Northern Nevada Correctional Center. And one of the things that I'll remember from that is that once um, we got in with the students, he just pulled his chair right up in front of them, sat down and asked them some um, really important questions. Uh, you know, some questions about what was working for them and some questions about what they um, thought could be done better. Um, and I, I think that the uh, interest in that program uh, has also translated into funding for our program from the state. So this last biennium, we received funding through the state, which really helped us expand our um, program. And um, I know it, it is being considered uh, for the next biennium to continue the funding, um, which will help us keep going. 
Uh, Dr. Solis, do you have anything else to add? Hey, People, Deb, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Deb? I can now. Okay, good. Now you get another I'm, picture. Okay. Excellent. Now you can see me and hear me? Now we can't go. Yes, okay. thank you. Now understand, if I would have had to fix that, it would have taken me a day. But, you know, Jackie got a handle for me, and I appreciate it. Uh, I'll start over. President Solis, thank you for those kind remarks and introduction. I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, what I said is WNC is a special place in my heart. I did spend 10 years on the Board of Regents and got to visit the campus probably once or twice a year and, and see how it grew and, you know, the way the students are served. But uh, the special place that WNC has doesn't even compare to the way I feel and my wife feel about the prison education program. It's absolutely been outstanding. What I got to see firsthand when I visited uh, was amazing in some of our facilities and how incredible the work that the school does in giving people a chance. So uh, I can't say enough good things about it. You've got an advocate, you've got a friend and anything I can do to make sure it continues, believe me, I'm 100% on board because it's that important. And this isn't something you gotta prove to me. I know this program works. It's proven itself, it works. And I'm so incredibly proud of the graduation graduates that you get. I mean, so incredibly proud that they've done it on their own and nothing's given to them. They work hard to get where they're at. And I have so much respect for that. It, it's a good thing. So uh, as we delve into discussion further and uh, find solutions to best support our students and our community members that find themselves in this transitionary period of their lives, I want to point out just a few facts about this population. It is important to note that 95% of the people who are currently incarcerated are going to be released back into our communities. As Nevadans, I firmly believe we can play an active role in providing the support needed for individuals so they can transition into becoming contributing members of our society. When I get to go and take tours and see that the work skills that people are learning it's phenomenal. And you can get out, you can make a good living, you can support yourselves, support your families and turn your lives around. And that's a, a fabulous thing to do. In 2016, the Rand Corporation, which is a nonprofit think tank, conducted a study which found that incarcerated people who participated in educational programs like this were 43% less likely to reoffend uh, the recidivism rate and return to prison, 43% less likely, which is, speaks, this is an investment, not in the, the school necessarily, but in the school, but in the people. And the people, the school is not bricks and mortar. Let me tell you something, that school is the people and the faculty and the students. That's what makes up Western Nevada College. That's what makes it up and that's what I'm so proud of is the people. The study also found the RAND study that for every $1 we invested in prison education, save $5 in reincarceration costs. Besides the lives that we're saving, it's a financially smart thing to do. To invest a dollar and get back five, we don't get that return very often. So it's key to not, ensure, not just ensuring individual success, but helps our state create safer communities and more robust, productive workforce by helping people become assimilated back into our communities. We don't have to venture too far to see that this type of investment in reducing recidivism works and it works very, very well. The program, BARD provides a great example of the potential of prison education programs is 85% of prisoners that graduate from the training program are employed within two months of their release. Within two months of the release, these people are employed. That's amazing, that's incredible and they're on the road to recovery and supporting themselves and their family into a better life for themselves. And uh, this very reason is why institutions of higher education and other organizations across the country are having similar conversa conversations to identify and implement these programs. And they're looking at the model, the prototype of what's happening at Western Nevada in order to see that this works. Let me tell you something, I do too many national governors meetings and democratic governors and Western governors and you know, gray-haired governors. I mean, I, I'm on every governor's group that there possibly is. And a lot of them are like, okay, how do you do it? How does it work? And it takes a lot. It takes a college to take an interest. It takes our training forces. I know some of our trade unions have come in and helped. It takes a lot of people to make this work. And I'm thankful for, the, for that. Uh, a successful re-entry program 
includes career transition into meaningful and gainful employment. That's why the two month issue is so important. It provides a pathway to, uh, to a better life and a better future. Student support services are key to retention and completion. And there's a need, there's a need for student support services that help address the specific needs of this student population. Colleges have an important role in advising the formerly incarcerated about fields in which they're welcome and a guiding role in helping them make connections with employers. We know that employers like hiring. The inmates that were incarcerated took the time because they weren't forced to get it. They had to work in order to get the education. This wasn't handed to you on a silver spoon, a silver platter. They had to work in order to make this happen. And employers know somebody that's willing to put forth that effort is a good role model, is a good employee to get in their corporation and somebody that they want to invest in. And these, these uh, employee associations have an important role in providing the opportunities for the job so that when you get out, we can provide you with that transition to the meaningful, gainful employment. We need to help combat imposter syndrome that they could be facing to make it known that successful reentry is possible. And most importantly, we need to reassure them that you do belong back in our society and you have our support. Your debt is paid, it's over, it's in the rear view mirror. Now you have a chance that we can support you in what you're doing and have you become con uh, contributing members of our society and to help other people and the education that you can help expend to other folks so that they don't uh, become incarcerated or violate. So that's important. So it encompasses everything from the formerly incarcerated challenges that you might have with, with housing, with transportation, with finances, and balancing the need to work with the need to pursue your education as you come out of the facility. Additionally, I was very proud of the fact that in 2019, uh, we signed a policy of banning the box on uh, our legislation on job applications, but that's no longer there. The box of are you, are you convicted a felon? You have a, a record that that's not there. So as I said, you've done your time. You've done it in a respectful, responsible manner, and that's over. And now we're here to help you get on with the next leg of your journey. There's still a lot of work left to be done. I don't want to give you the impression that it's finished. But I would be remiss if I did not highlight the current effort be ta being taken by Western Nevada and across our system of higher education. That includes working alongside Truckee Meadows Community College, Great Basin College, and the College of Southern Nevada to offer the students the ability to earn an associates or of general studies or an applied science degree while inside a correction center. That is just amazing that you can earn an associate degree while you're incarcerated and come out with that. And let me tell you something, when you have that degree, you make more money. You make more money, you get better jobs and you're gonna enjoy yourselves more. But it doesn't come. It's not, you know, click two cereal boxes and send it in with a dollar to get your degree. You're putting in work. These classes take effort, they take time. I fully understand that. And I respect the fact that you're willing to put in the time to participate. So I won't take up any more of your time. I know I won't way over the allotted time, but you know, since I'm the governor, they won't cut me off. They're being polite, I get that. But uh, I just wanna congratulate you and uh, let you know how proud I am. I guess that's the biggest thing. I mean, this is, you have risen to the top, which I truly respect. I admire you for what you've done and what you continue to do. And I have nothing but the best things to say and the best wishes for you. And again, you have my support from Carson City. I wanna thank President Solis in Western Nevada for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity because I get invited to a lot of things and unfortunately I've only got so many hours, a lot of them I don't get to do. This is one I wanted to do. This was one if I didn't get invited to, I'd have been calling and saying, what's the deal? You didn't invite me to the ceremony. So thank you for that. I appreciate all that you do and I'm committed to helping in any way I possibly can to assure your continued success. So with that, I appreciate you. I'm proud of you. God bless. Thank you. Governor. Thank you. On behalf of everybody, I want to thank you. And I want to just let the group know that, uh, Governor, you I know that you have an extremely busy schedule, but this is the fifth time that you've been to campus to either speak to our students or join us virtually. 
I don't know how many governors do that, uh, but uh, you, you're amazing. And uh, you've spoken to our nurses, to our Latino group, to our students in this in this program. You visited with us today, and you are a keynote speaker at graduation. Uh, we are so blessed to have you in this position. Thank you so much for everything you do for us in the state of Nevada. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate that. Thank you. I'm going to stay on and watch the video if that's okay. Excellent. We will um, okay. get that rolling now. And when we come back, I will do some introductions of our panelists and um, explain a little bit about using the Q&A and then we will get things going. Thank you. Great. BPI was the most challenging thing I've ever undertaken academically. Before then, everything I did academically was easy. That wasn't. But as I struggled and I worked hard and I, and I started taking my education to another level, I started kind of feeling cheated. Cheated by my early education, by my high school education. The fact that it wasn't challenging enough there is a, a dual educational system in this country. One for individuals who will rule and one for everyone else. And there's something inherently wrong and short-sighted in this because it takes for granted all the potential that lies at that other level, that they never get an opportunity to meet their potential. And what's the ramification of that for American society? I was denied the six months early parole release in October. I was struggling to uh, try to make sense of it. When I went back to the parole, I had a mental orientation that I deserve this. I know I did wrong, uh, but I've, I've served my time. When I heard I was going home in July, I was like, that's nothing. I'm so grateful to know that I have a date. All I need to know is that I will be going home. Nothing else is, is important. Um, and the four months is enough time for me to brush up on my German and <laughs> do some computer programming and, you know, to, put, to make the transition to prepare. I'm currently at a minimum security facility. I'm a city guy at heart, so it's like, wow, I'm here. From the top bunk, I could look out the window and see the Empire State Building. Twelve-year, sixteen-year-old kid standing outside, and it was a Thursday, so I'm like. What is he doing? That's what I was doing before. So I was like, wow, it's sad that, you know, um, I've, I've been away all this time and went through these transitions, but certain things uh, in the environment from which I came haven't changed. Commencement in the BPI program often involves giving two degrees. The first are the AAs. Those are the men and women who complete two years of college and they get an AA degree. What's very important to know is that the BPI students are required to do the same curriculum as students in a more conventional college setting. My fellow graduates, my friends, 
let me remind you that we have an obligation to share our stories and to uphold the idea that if we wish to have a better world, as we all do, then we must first change ourselves. Our stories, our lives, they are influenced by a great number of people. For me, my family has been My dad, Papa, I'm sorry for having dishonored our family, for putting you through such undeserved and unbearable pain. Papa, 사랑합니다. Thank you. Congratulations. Perception of time is beginning to shift for me because I'm around so many people with uh, just a little bit of time in jail and they count every day. And I had to push against it, like, you know, because I didn't spend my 22 years counting each day. My job has helped me to stay busy so I'm not sitting around counting days myself. I know I've got four weeks. Uh, I believe it's not appropriate to count days until you, uh, within one week. After you get to a week, then you can say, okay, I got seven days left. I look forward to getting with my family, meeting my little cousins, and spoiling my retired aunts. When I was younger, I used to walk around a lot. That's one of the things that I really want to do to be able to just walk without that officer, what I call the invisible chains. When I was uh, in high school, a group of my friends and I would always hang out in the mall at the World Trade Center and uh, talk to people from different schools. To be in jail and hear what happened with the World Trade Center really hurt me. So I also have that raw memory of its destruction. So I think to console myself, I would like to go there and, you know, see people living their normal lives. Just to be free, I guess, is something that I've I look forward to. It feels uh, very scary. I spent more time in prison than I did uh, in the free world. I came to jail when I was 17 years old. So it's like freedom, it's hard to visualize for me. Papers. No security escort.
You know, we sat there and we used to hang out here like it will always be here. Like it belonged to us. And now it's not here no more. Everything's different. Everything. I gotta prove that I'm worthy of this. I think there's a lot still at stake. There's one statistic that I read that uh, 47% of the people released return back to jail within one year. There is something that sits over my head and makes me critical and say, oh, make sure your re-entry is success for yourself but also for society and the people who are saying that you should stay in prison. So I carry all that. I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but um, when he talks about, when Joel talks about proving that he's worthy and about the chains um, that he is looking forward to walking without chains. That to me really speaks to the fact that those chains really are there after they are out. And that's one of the reasons we're here is to talk about the reentry process and um, hear from folks who have gone through that process and are continuing to go through that process. Um, so tonight we'll be taking a look at that experience. Um, there will also be some focus on um, colleges and what they can do to support our formerly incarcerated students. And I think regardless of whether or not you're on a college campus and can relate at that level, I think you'll take something away from hearing about their experiences. Um, I do want to introduce our panelists. It feels like it's been forever already that they've been sitting here and I have not had a chance to introduce them. I briefly introduced uh, President Solis earlier. He will be a moderator and answering some questions as well. So he'll be helping to run the show. Um, we also have Salima El Amin from um, College Behind Bars. She's one of the producers and um, decided to join us last minute. We're very happy to have her here to join us for this conversation. I also want to welcome James Kim, who was featured in the College Behind Bars documentary. He's a Bard Prison Initiative graduate, and he's also currently participating in the Bard Reentry Program. Um, he has been out since November 2020, if I remember correctly. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us all the way from New York. And I also want to welcome Omar McIntosh. Thank you for being here. Omar started college um, with WNC while he was incarcerated. And when he got out in September of 2020, he was able to transfer down to College of Southern Nevada and is pursuing a degree there, um, I believe, in Associate of Applied Science to become a diesel technician which I love because I have a diesel pickup truck. So thank you for pursuing that. And then last but not least, we have uh, Alex Silvera, who uh, he has actually been out the longest of the three and has been out since July of 2019. He's at the UNR campus uh, pursuing a bachelor's in engineering. He started with WNC inside, and when he came out, he finished his associate degree at TMCC and has now transferred over to um, UNR. So welcome all of you. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, and I do wanna tell all the attendees, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions if you have them. Uh, we will do our best to get to them. And last time we did a webinar, we ran out of time. Um, we'll see if we can make it this time or not. So please put them in there. We will do our best to get to them um, and uh, ask some of those questions. So uh, Vince, I think it's your turn to take it away. 
Thank you, Deb. Uh, Governor, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, please feel, to, feel, feel free to chime in as well, Governor, on these questions and these items. Uh, you know, Deb told me to prepare with some tissue because of these video clips. And every time I watch this, uh, I'm just extremely moved. For me as the college president, uh, all students, regardless of where they are at or where we serve them, are our students. And we take personal responsibility for the success of our students. So I'm really pleased to have some of our students today. And I want to thank uh, James as well for joining us all the way from the East Coast. Uh, can't thank you enough for being with us today to share some of these experiences so that we can help promote understanding about some of the challenges that relates to re-entry, which is what we're going to talk about. So Lima, on your end, I can't thank you enough for helping make this film. Uh, every time I watch this or watch clips of it, it just it just uh, pulls at the heartstrings in a lot of different ways. And, and my first question for you is, uh, did you have any knowledge about prison education programs prior to making this film? So um, just to say thank you, Dr. Solis, for having us here. Um, this is, you know, truly an amazing series, and we really appreciate the efforts that you guys are doing here at um, Western Nevada College. Um, you know, I was working with Lynn Novick, Kim Burns, and Sarah Botstein um, on the Vietnam War, and um, which is this multi-part 18-hour series. And um, at the end of the day, Lynn and Sarah would, you know, leave early to, to go to um, some facilities in New York State. And, and then finally I asked them, like, what are you guys doing? And they said, well, we're actually teaching a course um, through the Bar Prison in Initiative. And I, and I asked them, well, what is that? I've never heard of this. So I had no idea um, prior to working on this project. Um, that these kinds of programs existed. Um, and so uh, I was very fortunate to be asked to come on as a producer uh, on the project um, while we were doing the Vietnam War series and um, you know, really privileged to have the opportunity to help get this, um, this film um, you know, um, to, to air. Um, when I told my mother, who I was, I was so proud of myself that I was working on such an amazing project project about it. And she said, oh, you know, I used to teach uh, when I was uh, in my 20s, uh, when you were, uh, you know, a babe. And um, I used to go into women's prisons and, and teach, you know, once or twice a month. So that was back in the 70s. So apparently, yeah, as you know, you know, these programs have been around for a very long time. And I didn't know it was in the family. So, you know, so you said something about the programs existing. Uh... You know, we, we can't have these kinds of programs without policymakers, decision makers, and more importantly, champions and advocates like our governor, our legislature, who help support these kinds of programs. Because one of the biggest challenges that we have is how do we pay for scholarships and tuition? So uh, to, to all of those that are at the state level making these kinds of decisions and leading out front with difficult decisions uh, during difficult times, we can't thank the governor and, and the folks enough. Uh, because without those kinds of funds, we can't have these kinds of programs exist uh, from the ground up. So thank you so much, Lynn, for making this uh, amazing film. I have a follow-up question for you. Sure. As you were going through this process and in your conversations with the students in the prison education program, mm -hmm. uh, how did you how did you how do you think the students felt prior to being released? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of anxiety. You kind of saw mm -hmm. that in the clip. You know, there's this uncertainty, mm -hmm. and then they're released, and then they're challenged, as the governor said, and everybody else has talked about with it's not an easy road after they get released. So yeah. what were your thoughts about the process there when you were working with the students directly and trying to understand their stories better? Yeah, I mean that, um, you know, if we had the opportunity to make um, a, ser a second series or a second season, this would be the, the issue I would think we would want to focus on is the re-entry point. Because, I mean, we dive into it a little bit with Jewel Hall and his beautiful story. Um, but, you know, you know, and we did interview the um, students, James and, and others who, you know, about, you know, what are their planning? What's, what's their process? What it, who, who can support them um, on the way out? And, um, you know, it was um, a range because um, it depended on what kind of family who were back home who were, would be able to, you know, support them. Um, a question of where they would even live um, was a big question. You know, some who had um, felony records could not 
go back home because of the occupation of some, some of their family members. It was quite a range. And then we had others who um, were preparing for um, graduate school applications. Um, so, you know, because I think, um, you know, at least with um, BPI, many people are coming in at different stages and leaving at different stages. It just really was quite um, varied and, you know, people had different um, um, family um, configurations. And so I, it really, the whole reentry, and I'm so glad you guys are talking about this, this whole piece is um, an enormous task that should be broken down, should be really thought about and, and worked on and looked at from um, different, um, from all of these, um, you know, threats, because it really is quite complicated trying to put together um, a, a, a plan of action, especially while you're still inside and you don't know, you're not on the ground. And I'm sure, you know, that um, um, my colleagues here can speak, obviously, um, from their own experiences. But that's what I, that's what we observed when, you know, we were filming this film. Well, Salim, you know, if there's ever a part two to the documentary and the work that you do, I know a state out west uh, that has a, a great program and great stories with amazing students and policymakers that support these kinds of programs. So just shameless plug there for the state of Nevada and our programs related to prison education. Uh, we're going to move on to the students uh, because obviously developing that understanding and, and having that perspective of what it's like as they reintegrate into society is really important. So we're going to start uh, with Omar. Uh, Omar, obviously down in the southern part of the state at the College of Southern Nevada. Omar, congratulations on, on continuing your education there. Uh, the question that I have for you is, can you describe for us what it was like as you were about to exit uh, the correctional facility, returning into uh, society? Uh, what was it like coming back uh, to society after spending time uh, in a correctional facility? What was that like for you? And what was your experience like with receiving your education? When I, um, when I came home, it was scary because of the pandemic. And, you know, I have underlying health conditions. So it was kind of like, you know, I didn't know what to expect. And um, it was just like a, a barrier for me because <clears throat> I knew who to contact, but I didn't know how I was going to do it. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I had so many barriers in between me getting in contact with who I need to talk to and the things that I needed to do. It was so scary for me. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, um, when you think about technology and all the other stuff that comes with living in, in, inside American society that we have right now is very challenging. So it was a challenging thing for me, it was. Thank you, Omar. James, uh, you, you know, you're on the East Coast, a little bit different experience. You went through the, through the, the BPI program, which is the, the national model uh, for prison education programs. What were some of the challenges that you faced coming back into society and reintegrating? Um, no, I, I don't think of them in terms of challenges. Um, Obviously, there's an adjustment period when you first release from prison. I mean, that happens. I did 20 years of incarceration. That's not an easy thing to overcome. Um, but I will say that, you know, I was blessed to have a very strong network um, through BPI, through BPI's reentry program, and also the alumni network. BPI has been a program that's been going on strong for over 15 years. Um, we have many graduates who have successfully transitioned into work and are pretty far along in their careers. So that entire network um, exists and is very active for every new member that comes out. Um, and so, you know, just to point out that these, the story doesn't really just end with the education in prison. Um, it's actually a story that continues well into your first year or even, well, I'm still in my first year, so I can't speak for more than that, but, um, it's been it's been incredible um, the amount of support and really both both in terms of just people that you can interact with when you need them and also you know structurally you know I'm I'm actually involved in a lot of classes that teach you um, transitional skills learning about things like credit financial literacy um, help with job placement and job training the, all of these things exist and they 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 made my transition very smooth, I will say. You know, we, we hope to one day get to that level of support network for our students that are reintegrating, James. Obviously, BPI has been around a lot longer. 
uh, a, a deeper base of, of, of graduates. Uh, we hope to get there at some point. Alex, I'm gonna turn to you. you. You've been a student with us and now you're a student with TMCC. And we spoke a little bit last week about some of the challenges related to housing in particular and transportation. Can you speak to some of those? Because I know those are important elements that a lot of people don't think about as it relates to how you reintegrate into society when you don't have transportation or access to affordable housing. If you, if you can talk to some of those, that, that'd be helpful for, for us as a, as a group to get better understanding of some of the challenges you have. So I know when I was uh, going to TMCC, my main mode of transportation was uh, the bus. And you had to rely. So my goal then is I didn't want to be late for my classes. So I would plan ahead. I would show up early um, because, you know, sometimes the bus can be finicky. Luckily, when I was going through school at TMCC, we were able to use our IDs from TMCC to ride the bus for free. So that helped me out a lot. Um, I didn't have to worry about a bus fare because I was going there. You know, I, I'd go back and forth sometimes twice a day. And, you know, it's like $3 a trip. Um, housing is a, it's a different subject, I kind of feel, because I was a felon. I, I am a felon that um, people judge me. And I, I get, like I said, that day that we talked, I felt like I was redlined. I was forced into areas that I wasn't, um, that wasn't very accommodable or comfortable for me. You know, like it's, it's kind of a little bit on the poor side, or there's a lot of stuff going on here that I don't want to be a part of because that is my history. So I know those are some challenges I've had to deal with. And I feel like I'm kind of forced to buy a home rather than live in an apartment because I always get denied because of my, my history. Yeah, you know, you, we, we also had some conversations last week with the group of students. And uh, one of the things that I found fascinating about our conversation as we were preparing for this was access to food and how, you know, once you're released and you integrate into society, managing food, uh, the, the kind of food that you eat, the health and the things that come with us. I thought that was a fascinating discussion about uh, the challenges with reintegration that we don't think about. Omar, James, you guys had some pretty specific uh, thoughts about this. Can you guys elaborate a little bit about that for the audience? President Solis, I yes, sir, Governor. Moment, I apologize. And, and I've really enjoyed listening to this. I appreciate the video, but I appreciate you guys sharing your stories. I mean, it, it's uh, incredible. Uh, I apologize, I've got to run to another meeting, but no, I am so proud of the work that you guys are doing and the way you've adjusted and reintegrated. Re integrated. Uh, it's amazing. And it's something that you should be proud of and just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, we'll use those examples for other folks. So thanks for inviting me to be here. And President, I'm counting on you next time, invite me back, okay? Absolutely, Governor, thank you so much. Okay, thank thanks with everybody, us. have a great be day. Safe, Governor. Care. Take care. Bye-bye. So on that question, uh, students, uh, we had that conversation last week a little bit, which I found it fascinating because there are challenges that we, you know, if, if we're in society, we don't think about some of these things. So James, you, you had some pretty poignant points on this. Can you, can you discuss some of these uh, uh, pieces? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If I recall, it, it, the conversation stemmed from uh, the fact that I've actually gained weight. I'm, I think a lot of us coming out of prison. Alex mentioned that this is pretty common. Um, what happens is, you know, you're deprived in prison for so long and prison food is rightly reviled. Um, and you get out here and you now have to manage things um, like your diet, things that, you know, you might not necessarily have been on your radar when you were thinking about your transition. And, um, you know, in many ways people have come to form patterns in their life where they, they learn how to manage things like not just food, but um, distractions in terms of social media or learning how to manage their time. Um, these very, very small everyday things, I think, suddenly appear. And you know, you, you come, you either have to come to grips with them or they kind of take over. Um, in my case, I think I gained a good five or 15 pounds, but some of that is COVID weight. So I will um, I will I will say that. Okay, very good. Uh, you know, I've got one more question for the students, and then I'm gonna go back to Salim uh, on some of these other questions. For the students, you know, we've talked about things like transportation. We talked about things like housing. We talked about things to access to food. Let's talk a little bit about technology because we also spoke about that last week. When you spend a considerable amount of time uh, incarcerated and then you come out and the world has changed uh, so much uh, as it relates to technology, the use of phones, the use of social media, the use of, you know, we spoke a lot about Google Docs and how you use just some of the things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis 
uh, in the work environment. Omar, Alex, and James, can you guys talk a little bit about reintegration as it relates to understanding, you know, technology that has advanced so far while you've been, uh, you know, incarcerated? Yeah, technology changes every year, you know, so it's like um, when you're in, in, stagnant, in a stagnant state where you're in prison and you don't have these types of things there for you on your hand, it's always a, a challenge because you don't know, you know what I'm saying, you're in the unknown. And like, uh, I think, uh, Alex, you said it last week about the cell phones, you know, a lot of people don't know how to get out here and work on cell phones after doing 20 years, after doing 15 years, because every year they change. And it's not like you're going to, you know, have a whole, uh, a whole map set up there for you to work the phone, because you're going to be like, okay, well, this is my phone. I have to do what I have to do. Even with computers going and building a, a resume or, you know, just trying to get on there, like I said, Google Docs and trying to, you know, upload this full file to your teacher's file. And this is how they want you to do it. But you have to, you have to learn to adapt. And it's very hard to, because you don't get that inside of prison. You're not going to get that in a place where you can sit down and actually learn that. You have to deep, dig deep down inside yourself and ask questions. A lot of people don't like to ask questions, but you have to ask in order to get the knowledge to know how to navigate. You know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was hard for Mr. Kim because he just did 20 years. And look how far back that's been. That was 2000, you know? And mm -hmm. the things that we are challenged with inside, like on the, on the inside, we just don't get that knowledge. We don't get a lot of that knowledge at all. Well, I know. either that or we don't. Alex? Yeah, no, I was gonna say, I know, I know for me, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I know for me, a lot of times I had to utilize all my resources at the school, whether that's like a career studio or any other resource that was available to help guide me through it. And I had help from a lot of the students because they were younger than me and they were hip and they knew about these things and how to navigate them. And so I, I leaned on them a lot to um, learn the functions of these new apps and what they meant and how, like where, where their platforms are from. So that's how I did it. If I might, if I can add, um, it's relevant, you know, especially if you're entering the workforce um, with a college degree because it's a different type of work you'll be engaged in and it's very heavily dependent on computer use and being knowledgeable about you know just the entire g suite um and again i, I will point out that i was tremendously lucky to have a, a, a support network through my school which provided a lot of hands-on training with um all of these all of these different elements and um people that you can troubleshoot with and you can call when you're frustrated and, and you don't know how to share a document um, you know, these things are, are, are tremendously useful. Absolutely. Salim, I want to come back to you, ma'am. You, you know, obviously, as a filmmaker, you learned a lot about the process from A to Z as it involves students in these types of prison education programs. You also learned a lot about family interactions as it relates to the kinds of support that students have or don't have while they're working through these areas. In your opinion or your experience, how critical is that family unit or that community support uh, to a successful reentry for the students that are coming back uh, into society. Yeah, I mean, from uh, my, my limited experience with the BPI program, um, you know, family is critical. Um, you see how certain students were able to kind of land on their feet because family was there to support them to the point where they were providing housing to ones who struggle and couldn't go back to family for a variety of reasons, whether it was probably not the right environment, they're not, not in the right state. I mean, some in some cases you are, you know, folks here know you are returned in some cases to a place that is not where your family is and you have to be there for a while. So, um, and, and then you have to find housing and support and, and all that. And so it's very difficult, I think at least from what we, we, we observed. Um, but I will say too, you know, the, I, the concept of family is being expanded, right? And James um, just commented on that, on, as well as Alex, this network of uh, individuals who have come back, who've returned, who are, they, they've known, you know, while they were incarcerated are helping them, um, you know, succeed and, and and, and re-enter. And um, I think the concept of family, if it can be expanded, and I think BPI is doing that, you know, um, through re-entry, re it's, you know, could, these are the things that you need. This is the support that we can provide. These are the people that you can call. That was really quite amazing. And I think because BPI 
was such an old program, like you mentioned, um, Dr. Solis, that there was this deep bench of alumni um, network that could could do that. And so, um, you know, if individuals, certain individuals in our film who couldn't go back to family for a variety of reasons, um, could you know, extend our idea of family, you know, in terms of, you know, reaching out to their um, fellow cohorts. Absolutely. You know, as we move through the program, I believe some of the students, uh, James, if I'm not mistaken, you also have some questions uh, that you wanted to ask uh, from a student perspective. Uh, now would be a great time to kind of hear some of those questions and we can provide the feedback on some of those items. Absolutely. I mean, you know, for then Alex, Omar, and myself, you know, we, we know our stories and we know stories like ours, but, you know, for, for you as an educator, as a president of a college, and, and Salima, you as a, a filmmaker, um, a film producer, having hear, now hearing all of these stories and kind of encountering different kind of perspectives on it, on things that aren't necessarily part of the broader conversation of, you know, incarceration, um, what have you, <laughs> um, let me, let me phrase this the right way. Um, what are your takeaways? I mean, and, and mm -hmm. what do you see as a role for yourself within your institution mm -hmm. or the film you know, industry um, yeah. in kind of being part of that conversation? Right. So for me, if I don't mind, if you don't mind, jump, I jump in. But I think for um, you know, uh, some of the goals that we set out as um, part of the film team and um, trying to you know, bring to light um, these issues um, through film was to take it a step further. Um, you know, uh, Florentine Films, Kim Burns, not known for advocacy, and yet we decided to um, push the film out to as far as we could and talk to as many um, stakeholders as we could find to try to change the, um, not just the narrative, but also, you know, real action laws and, you know, um, having, you know, screenings on Capitol Hill with um, Congress people um, speaking, you know, to um, state representatives, just to, you know, look into how we can um, support, um, you know, this movement really. And so, you know, we're very fortunate to be part of this whole process and with the, you know, repealing of the um, ban on Pell um, you know, we feel like that was, um, you know, part of one of our goals to, to help support, but also just really keeping the narrative alive, you know, making sure folks are, are, are watching the film, making sure it's available as long as it can be for free through streaming services and just let people know, just to, to know your stories to, you know, because I think it begins with empathy at the very least. You know, and, and from my end, uh, James, I, I think Salim hit it, uh, the, hit the nail on the head in terms of that empathetic uh, approach. Uh, for me, all of our students, regardless of what facility or where they are at, are exactly that. They are our students. We have a personal responsibility uh, to them. We have a personal responsibility to help them be successful in every way that we can. Uh, we will never refer to our students in any other way uh, other than that they are our students, they're at our Warm Springs campus, they're at our Northern Nevada campus, uh, but they are our students nonetheless, and we treat them as such. We, we hold them uh, accountable from the perspectives of the academic roles. We provide those high quality services in the same way we would any of our students. We have that personalized instruction. So for me, understanding that that reintegration is difficult, uh, there, there's so many facets to it. Uh, we learn something new from those experiences from our students every day. Uh, but for me, what's most important is that we have a moral and ethical obligation to every student that comes to our doors, regardless of the path that they've taken to get to our doors, to, for us to ensure their success. So uh, for, for us, it's really about uh, helping every single student that we have, regardless of where they're at and how we serve them to be successful. James, I believe you had one other question as it relates to um, education overcoming all obstacles. Uh, you wanted to elaborate a little bit on that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very moved by the fact that, you know, you, as a president of a college, you know, you see your students, you see us, or you see um, the students on your campus as just that, students. And I was wondering if you, you know, do you have any plans 
And you know, now that you're aware of the type of barriers you know, that exist for your students um, on these campuses and when they're released, you know, do you have any plans to overcome them or, or what's in the works to kind of um, help your students? Yeah, area? absolutely. I, yeah, that's a great question. I think that uh, one of the things uh, that's top of mind for us is bringing awareness. That's why we're having events like this. Uh, I think that this is critical so that we can provide perspectives, not only understanding in terms of the challenges, but perspectives in terms of the pragmatics associated with not having our students return to incarceration. Uh, we want them to be successful. So that's the first piece. The second is we're planning for the expansion of our program uh, with the expansion of Pell Grant opportunities. You know, we talked a little bit about earlier that uh, decision makers in the state of Nevada from our chancellor to our regents to the decision makers, uh, our governor, uh, all of that requires a team and people willing to say yes and support these kinds of programs. So we have that in place right now. What we want to do is upscale that. And what does that entail? That in, you know requires more teachers, requires more support. It requires having someone uh, connected to the process once they're leaving the institutions. I think one of the things that we need to also develop is going to be an opportunity for us to train the students that are about to transition on the use of technology and what to expect as they reintegrate. So our program, even though has been around a long time, uh, is I think in its infancy in terms of reinventing itself and how we serve students. So there's lots to come on that. We're looking forward to Pell Grant opportunities so that we can expand the services. Uh, but with all of those, the end goal remains the same and that's to provide education uh, because education has the power to transform lives so that none of our students go back to those facilities. I would much rather hear, we would all much rather hear about the success students are having in life and everything that they're doing, but not going back because that, that, that uh, we don't want that to be an option. We want everything else to be available to them, uh, but that door needs to close uh, once they leave those facilities. If I can add just one thing and something Alex brought up, um, something as small as a bus pass, um, which allowed him to you know, move around. Um, had a, you know a strong impact on his continuing education. So you know I just want to point out that the scope of um, what a school can offer um, a student is is actually very very broad and impactful. Absolutely. Okay, I think we need to roll clip two. Um, thank you guys for sharing, and um, we'll roll clip two, and we'll be back after that. Being in prison for so long, I can't say the things that I experienced there are no longer part of me. I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. I was on a train. And this lady got on, she explained she was homeless and she would sing a song for us. And she sung Sam Cooks, I believe, A Change Gonna Come. And that was one song when I was in prison that I always felt emotional whenever I heard it. So, uh, she went through this beautiful rendition of Sam Cooke's A Change Gonna Come on Prison That. The tears was flooding in my eyes. And when she finished, the first thought that came to my head was, I gotta get out of prison. Here I am standing on the A train, and the thought came in my head, I need to get out of prison. I have to remind myself, yo, you don't have to worry about that no more.
I've been fortunate enough to have a loving family that has taken me in. It's like a big relief. This is my view, beautiful view. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's way better than the one I had in prison. I got the, the German app on my phone. <laughs> so, you know, I still play, you know, uh, I, have, I, I quiz myself in German. I'm amazed that I'm still able to get 70 to 80% of it right. This is my comfortable bed, you know. Uh, my aunt was gracious enough to get me a nice, uh, comfortable bed. This is a different phenomenon for me. It's like uh, a personal space where there's no CO f shining a light on on me. So, you know, this is good for me, you know. So, uh, yeah, this is my room. I thank a higher power for being here. <laughs> Early in the morning when I get up. Thank you for waking me up here and no longer in that cell, you know? Thank you. We have 300 people we've got now. I'm working with about 50 to 60 people a year, whether it's academic placement or job placement or was first job or career job. The level that we're working at is very intimate, very personal. You go in with your resume, it's like, you're gonna have to explain where you were. And you'll be honest about every detail of it. And for the rest of your life, you're gonna, you need to learn how to do that. Because people are gonna wanna know. I apply for uh, public health positions. And my incarceration came up. I noticed that the interview became, the tone and the feel became quite different. You have this apparent suspicion in this conversation and it was really discouraging. You do your time and you still getting judged about from your past. You know, every time you put down for a job application, they deny you, they deny you. And you don't want to lie, they say, be truthful, be honest. And you tell them, they're like, no, nah, you can't work here. It happened to me like five, six times since I've been home. My little brother moved to Atlanta. You know, he's out there trying to establish a life for himself coming out of prison. His latest job let him go because of his criminal background. Seeing him, I'm also being confronted with that. You know, am I gonna have these type of problems? You know, I did my time. Okay, I'm on parole as it is. Like, what else do you want from me? Like, he just closing the door on me, closing the door on me. The reality of the matter is that we're only 10% of the population in one prison. In one prison, we're 10% of the pop. What about the other prisons in the system, right? And, and the lack of programs, the lack of anything meaningful to these guys that we're saying we want to let them out, right? Is anybody, like, really stopping to explore? When we talk about reform on the ground in here, right, with the guys that we lock around, what does reform look like? What does it even mean to them? I didn't come to prison to go to college. You know, I came here and I got really, really lucky and did some things right. But at no time do I want to be some type of poster boy for like, look at what prison can do for you. It's a very stressful and kind of disgusting place. You know, it's a bad place. If I had to choose to go to college, I would not do it here. You framed it as you don't want to be an example of what prison can do for you. It's not what prison is doing for you. This is what education is doing for you. True. You go home and say, I went to, I messed up. I went to prison. You got lucky, like you said. You made it here. You got into BPI. You learned. And you are no longer the same person you was when we were together in Five Points. Am I wrong? No, you know. Did prison do that for you or did education do that for you? Education. When I came to prison, the first thing I was thinking about was how do I get into college? That was my primary concern. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. 
There are groups all over the prisons, all over them. They're ready. They're ready. They just need the opportunity. I, I, and then they will do whatever it takes to get in that seat. The overwhelming majority of individuals are going to be released from prison. They're coming back home. They're coming back into their communities. So if I'm able to successfully intervene in their lives, then I'm saving further victimization. I'm saving taxpayer dollars. Hello, Picture Motion Jewel speaking. You can almost understand why people are hesitant to hire people who have been in prison. And I run a company of 20 something year old women. And so I'm responsible for bringing this person on paper who might look scary into our office because he's been in prison for 22 years. She went to prison for illegal possession of a weapon, and I think accessory to a murder. And he is a very tall human. <laughs> And then you meet Jewel. So after the first interview, we're like, this guy's obviously great. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. He's got more degrees than my partner and I combined. He speaks more languages than our office combined. <laughs> and so we, we called around, and every reference we called confirmed what we thought about him. And so we offered him the job. I'm having problems with the internet over here. We have had problems last week. And I just wanted to check to see if it, there were any uh, indications that there was problems in the area. A lot of our operations work is computer-based, and he had to catch up on 20 years of computer history. I've learned that when it comes to whether it's the technology, the iPad or the iPhone, it's a challenge for regular people who've been out here all this time. Sorry, Wendy, we got a lot going on here today. One of the most problematic things for me is the username and the password because it's like i never had to use a password only number i had to remember was my state press number nine. if this is correct press one wendy can you hear us yeah can you hear me yes i can hear you <laughs> i'll be 41 years old uh november 8th I think I am most proud of, of, of holding a job. It's just me and my aunt, and we have a nice, comfortable space. Oh my, that looks good. I already tried it. <laughs> you already looked at the big piece missing already, huh? I'm into the little things. Just. Being free for me is a blessing, and uh, to be able to mark another year alive and free is all I need. <laughs> mm. nah, that's great. All right, so we are going to dive into part two now. Um, Vince, take it away. Thank you, Debs. Uh, we're going to go right back to the students on this. Uh, this is a question for James. James, can you give us a little bit of an overview of the BARD prison education program that you were a part of? It's the same one that we've shown in the video clips. Uh, give us a little bit of, uh, you know, of a sense for what that program was like. Um, yeah, in, in a word, it's, uh, it's rigorous. <laughs> um, the BPI program, in, in so many ways, you know, immediately right from the door holds you to an incredibly high standard. And they really don't let up. They just actually increase the pressure. But you know what you find is that you know the students who are in the student body and who participate in the program are eager for that that level of difficulty. They're eager to prove themselves, and that translates. You know, for the rest of their life, they become driven not just to exist but to succeed. And you know, you know, you'll find that you know that treating inmates or treating people with complicated histories, you know. To holding them to a, a standard that they, you know, in society's eyes, they might not have earned yet, will actually cause them to kind of rise to that level. And so, you know, one of the things about BPI is that, you know, it's academically rigorous, um, and but it's also a close knit community, as you saw in the clip. That little library room, which I'm very familiar with, um, was a, a seat for many discussions, um, a lot of a lot of kind of community building. And um, so, you know, Bard is is a lot more than just a school. Um, it, it becomes, 
in a way, a community and an identity, and one that you can kind of take with you for the rest of your life. And, um, and I find that to be, you know, tremendously useful now that I'm out. Very good. Uh, this question is for uh, Omar and Alex and James, if any of you want to respond to this, but as you were reintegrating and transitioning back to the world in terms of uh, reintegrating to society, was there any one person that stood out for you that helped you make that transition more successfully? And if there was that person, what about them helped you so much in terms of your reintegration? Camille Sun Vega. She was... Uh, she was instrumental in my reintegration. She uh, kept me positive. Um, she kept pushing me. She kept checking up on me. She was there for me. And uh, I really feel like she was one of the main people that helped walk me through getting my degree at TMCC. And Camille is, is uh, one of our colleagues at TMCC for the audience. Thank you, Alex. Um, Omar, was there anybody Vega, that helped you out? Ms. Ms. Vega also helped me um get uh, situated in CSN. So I got connected with Ms. Devon and then she helped me all the way. She did like all my paperwork, man. I was just so happy because I didn't know how to do, go through all doing all that, you know, and uh, I was very um, enlightened, you know, when she just sat down and took her time to help me get through all the things that I needed to get through. And it was very helpful to me, you know, and it was, it was like, I was so stressed out, man, but she calmed every, she calmed my storm. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's really great working with uh, our colleagues across the system here in Nevada that can help our students, whether they're coming from our mm -hmm. program or CSN and TMCC has a great reintegration program. So we're real, real grateful for the partnership. Uh, James, what about you? Is there anybody that helped you integrate beyond? I know you've talked about the folks from BARD and, and the support system, but was there that one person that, that helped you transition? And if there was, what was it about them that helped you through the process? Well, uh, this is actually, this ties into kind of the way the school is structured. You know, when you graduate with a, a bachelor's degree with, you know, for BPI, you engage in what they call a senior project or senior thesis. And you're, um, you're assigned an advisor who you work with very closely. And, you know, you develop a very close relationship with that person that extends, you know, for the rest of your life, really. And so my advisor has been a tremendous, you know, source of support for me. Um, and another person you saw on the video was Jed Tucker, who who's been a, a rock. And um, he he's part of the reentry program, but he's just the tip of the iceberg. So um, I would say the single most person, you know, person who's actually helped me integrate the most was that senior advisor that I was assigned to. Um, but that I've developed a very close relationship. Very good. And, and another question for the students. Uh, you've all reintegrated. Uh, what has been the single and continues to be the single hardest part about reintegration? Um, with me, I think it's just uh, the reality of, you know, being out and having to do things on your own and not going back to those old ways that you used to have because it's easy to fall in that trap you know, and get sucked into all the other things that has led you to be in prison, you know, and when people see that you're doing the right thing, it kind of gives them an idea like, wow, then he's really changing, you know, because a lot of people don't believe in us. They think that, you know, we just plan or this is just another phase we're going to go through. We'll be back, you know, and it's hard to get people to understand that you can't doubt me without doubting yourself. You have to doubt yourself first. You have to look at you. You know, you can't look at me. Just watch what I do. <laughs> and let me do what I need to do, you know? And that's the biggest thing to me is, you know, uh, dealing with that doubt from other people and, and other people see that you're trying to change and they always trying to pull you back. I think uh, for me, it's uh, trying to build connections with people that don't come from the same background that I come from. So um, a lot of these people that I'm trying to build connections with ha have like a leg up in the community. Like they come from different backgrounds. Uh, they, they're they're um, doing things at a younger age. And so I have to teach myself how to connect with them because I know they're going to be my peers throughout the rest of my life if I want to continue that. And I know a lot of the people that I know are negative. And like Omar was saying is, is they bring you down and it's like they never want to see you succeed. So just kind of segueing off of what he said, it's, it's trying to do that and build new relations. That way I know I can push forward and I can reach new heights. So, yeah. James? Yeah, I think what Omar says really resonates with me because, you know, it was mentioned before, but imposter syndrome is a, is a genuine feeling that, you know, it's difficult to overcome. And, you know, coming from where we came from and doing any length of time, you kind of internalize all of these doubts 
Um, and you know, in, in many ways, when you first get out, you're very fragile. Um, and so overcoming that, um, especially when you know you enter the workforce, um, which I was you know, fortunate enough to do, I doubt myself, I doubt my abilities when you know I really shouldn't. Um, and I know um, intellectually that I shouldn't, but nevertheless, deep down inside, you feel a little off. Um, and I think that's one of the hurdles that I'm trying to overcome. You know, I, I know it's easier said than done because you're the ones that are living this experience. Uh, but don't give up on your dreams, regardless of anything that comes your way. And I think that the, that's the internal strength. You know, you've survived a very difficult environment. Uh, stay focused on your goals and your dreams and, and you'll get there. And I know it's easier said than done because you've got to, you're the ones that are living this experience. Uh, but if there's anything that we can ever do to help in those capacities, know that you always have an open door and a straight shot uh, to call me uh, or connect with me. And if there's something we can do to assist, absolutely. But don't give up on your dreams at any at any level. Uh, Salim, let me ask you a question. And this is from, you know, obviously a filmmaker. You've learned a lot through the process. You get to see the educational perspective. And, you know, in the same way that Omar mentioned that, you know, there's doubt uh, from the, the, the general body at large about their circumstances, there's always a, a, a you know, this perception that educators, you know, we live up here and the world is always rosy. Uh, you've seen both sides. You work with the educators and you work with departments of corrections on the East Coast as you were working on this film project. How do you see the approach from Bard, uh, who is, is immersed in transforming the lives through, the, through their prison education program versus how Department of Corrections uh, in New York manages reintegration, reintegration and transition back? Or what are your thoughts on that? Right. You know, I think with Bard, they... Um... No, that's an interesting question. I, I just, I think Bard is looking at the, at the student after they release in a much longer lens. So um, there is a more comprehensive um, set of programs. And, um, you know, earlier today, I wanted just to check in with um, you know, with bar just to see what exactly they're doing. Of course, James explained, you know, a little bit of what they're doing, but, um, you know, what they have created for their students seems um, compared to what the Department of Corrections is doing um, and, and many others across the country, it's not just New York, is, you know, really a model, uh, you know, that they should look to or, or follow or try to, you know, and I, and I hold, and I will explain what they, you know, some of the things they're doing, but, um, you know, it's incumbent upon us as citizens to hold our own, um, you know, governor, go government officials uh, accountable to make sure that our, you know, returning citizens have what they need. So from, you know, re-entry workshops, like James was talking about, one-on-one -on -one advising, um, an annual publication of going home and continuing education guides, um, transitional workshops, housing, um, and continuing education, helping, you know, their students to, you know, continue on. I mean, that is, you know, far and beyond probably what many Department of Corrections are even funded to do. So, you know, I think, it, you know, for us and for me as a, as a citizen, I'm looking to BARD and saying, what is my, what is my government? What is my state government? What is my, you know, city government doing that replicates that because that seems to be working with a 4% recidivism rate in the Bard Prison Initiative, um, you know, um, you know, uh, population. I mean, that's tremendous, you know, and that um, is the goal, you know. Yeah, the, 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 the rates are, are pretty off the charts. It's, it's a phenomenal program. So interesting perspective. James, I, I think you also had a couple of questions for your fellow students and uh, wanted to have some discussion between the students about some of the things that are important to you all as students that have reintegrated? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm impressed by the fact that for me, the road was easy. You know, many people are familiar, people who've watched a documentary with BPI and BARD and how it operates. But, you know, in Nevada, you know, Omar, Alex, you guys are kind of like trailblazers. You guys are pioneers. You guys are kind of like this first group that are it's kind of going to set the tone. So, you know, I, I had questions really about like Omar, how did you get involved in education while you were incarcerated? Um, you know, and honestly, how did you take that with you when you got out to continue your education, which is an entirely different thing? 
what happened was I had uh in 2017 I got my uh, my high school diploma and uh my teacher kept telling me he said man you're smart you know you need to figure out what you want to do after this he said because you can have a, a high school diploma he said but it's all about what you're doing after that's going to make your life better and I had seen like a uh, they had like a, a, a memorandum you know, saying that they was giving out scholarships to go to WNC, West Nevada College. And I'm like, well, maybe that's something I need to look into. And the first time that I got in there, um, I, I think I took math and it was a good class, man. That teacher was very helpful. You know, I was really bad on math, but once I got to sitting down and, and really going through the schematics, it helped me. So when I first did that, um, that first class, I, went, I got transferred to another prison, which is Warren Springs, and I took my uh, political science. I said, man, listen, this is something I need to get a hold of because I can see, you know, the difference in the, the, the education uh, on an educational standpoint. So it just made me want more for myself. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it had gave me an understanding to have an opportunity to get out and try it. You know what I'm saying? Because the only thing that you can do is, is give yourself a chance to survive and make it in life. And that's what I did, man. I just gave myself a chance. Yeah, no, I hear you. You know, education is a journey and along the way, you know, the, your, the people who help you along the way are really become a part of your story. Um, was there anyone else who really stood out to you besides, you know, your GED teacher you mentioned um, um, and some of the instructors you had? Uh, really, um, just the, the, the faculty members, you know, like as far as the COs, because, you know, I, I didn't really like be tripping with COs or, you know, talking bad to nobody. I was just very straight up. And the CEOs would see me coming back with my books and, you know, going to college. They're like, man, we, I tip my hat to you, man, because you're really trying to do the right thing, you know? And that kind of gave me a good outlook, too, because I'm like, man, if they can see the change in me, what about me seeing the change in me, you know? So that was a big deal to me. No, absolutely. Um, Actually, if I can pivot to Alex, Alex, you've been out for a while and, you know, from all my, our conversations, you know, you're tremendously driven. Um, you've, you've accomplished so much overcoming hurdle, hurdles in terms of housing and on campus now earning your, your BA. Um, could you speak about that a little bit? Like what drives you and, and what helped you or what hindered you? So what drives me is the love for uh, math and the way things works. So that I want to be part of, you know, something that helps change the world. I say that all the time when people ask me like, what is your goals? And I tell them like, I want to change the world. And I think the best way I could do that is by getting into like renewable energy or trying to figure out where I can fit in to make the world a better place. Um, hindering me, uh, if I run into something that hinders me, I, I make sure I, I pull out of it. I can't really speak on too much that's hindered me because I've driven and I've pushed hard to get to where I'm at today. And I don't think I'll let myself give that up. I feel like I have enough drive in me to do what I need to do. And I know if I were to run into challenges, I'll have a huge support group out here. So many doors have opened for me since I've been out and, and everything that I've done that I'll just reach out and I'm like, look, I'm struggling. Can you help me? What do I do? How do I get back to where I need to be? So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, you mentioned before um, in one of our, our other conversations that you're involved with um, formerly incarcerated, you know, politics basically and returning citizens and you know could you speak elaborate on that in, in any way how your experiences might kind of want you to help you pay it forward what uh what do you mean I, well I, I, well you know in terms of building a larger network um that you're part of you know that your education kind of you know gives you insight into how transformative things can be um do you have any thoughts about how you know this this can turn into something you know larger than perhaps just your own situation Oh yeah, absolutely. I feel like the more people become aware about what's going on and how they can shape it, I'm a firm believer and I've read studies before. I can't put numbers out there, but I've, I've read it before that people with uh, you know, a degree or people that have pursued higher education coming from prison are less likely to go back to prison. So I, I'm a firm believer and I try to push people. Like I work at the Ridge House right now and that's like a rehabilitation center. And I know I push that on a lot of the gentlemen coming back from incarceration, like, hey, uh, I, got, I got a great person you can go link up with, go get yourself into school, uh, make sure to take that step and take that leg up because like it's there and it's up to you if you want more. And, and I'm a believer of that. 
So I do, I push that on every, everybody that I know that's asking for help. What do I do in life? Where do I go from here? And I'm like, okay, this is what we could do. This is where you could go. What do you like to do? What do you want to study? What do you want to be? What are your goals? What are your, what's your five-year plan? What's your three-year plan? What's your six month plan? Like, let me know and like, let's get that done. So. Good. So Liam, let me ask you a question. You know, you were involved with this project for a long time. You learned a lot about uh, best practices. What do you see uh, that's happening on the East Coast? And you've learned a little bit about our program here in Nevada. What are some things you think we could be doing differently or, you know, looking at some best practices to help improve our program for the students that we serve? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> I, well, I mean, I think it just takes time to really build out, you know, a, a program like BPI that's been around for 20 plus years. Um, but, you know, the one thing that I think is really unique um, is number one, having a um, the ability to get the bachelor degree. I, I believe it's, you know, your program is up to associates, which actually is, you know, you're already um, beating the odds with just that, which is really amazing. Then you can build on that. Um, but um, also I think if, you know, just expanding, keep expanding your program if you can, you know, allowing individuals to pursue math and, or, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, uh, political science, all of that. I mean, the, the, the more subjects that can be offered, it seemed to me, you know, help open the landscape for, um, you know, the students to, you know, kind of imagine what kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, just the possibilities, the world, you know, how they can access their own internal um, thoughts and, and rebuilding or building themselves, but also um, what they can do after. So, um, but yeah, I think you guys are doing a great job. Yeah, yeah there, there's always uh, room for growth. Absolutely. Very good. James, I, I think you had a question related to, um, uh, you know, the kind of responsibilities that educators have uh, in these kinds of, of, of roles. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a president of, you know, your, your, your college, I was wondering, you know, how you view the responsibility you might have towards your students and, you know, your, you know, your incarcerated students as well as the returning citizens. Um, and, you know, if you see any opportunities on the horizon for not just expanding your program, but just expanding all facets of it. You know, I, I think this is a, a great question to, to end our conversation on for tonight anyway. Uh, I know that we've got some uh, comments that'll be coming from Debs as we close out. We're running a little bit behind schedule. So I'll, I'll close with these thoughts. I think that as educators, we have a, a moral imperative to serve every single student that uh, comes to us in the best way that we can, in the best way that we know how. Uh, for me, whether you're at Warm Springs or Northern Nevada Correctional Facility or any of the facilities that we serve, whether it's on campus, online, remote, uh, or in this case, in our prison education program, we have a responsibility to help you be successful. And that varies from uh, providing advisors and counseling, the support staff, the resources, the scholarships, uh, but more importantly, a pathway that gives our students hope. And I know that in a situation like you have all been, your bodies may be behind uh, walls uh, in an incarcerated facility, but your minds are free to explore. Your minds are free to grow and you have the ability to become anything that you want, regardless of the circumstances that you're in. And I know that that's hard, uh, but I think that uh, for us as administrators, it's kind of like the doctors, medical doctors, they take a Hippocratic oath to serve anybody that needs health and wellness, regardless of who they are. Uh, for us, it's the same. We have an obligation to serve everybody that comes in our doors, regardless of where they're at or where we're serving them in the best way we know how. So. Uh, I think it's just about being committed to education because we know that education changes lives. Okay, so we are just past the 630 mark. So it is time to wrap up. Um, and I, I want to read um, something that came in. Um, I think at least Omar and Alex saw this, but I think that this is a really um, great way to close out. And in our Q and A, um, Ricky Medina shared, First off, thank you all for sharing. I help run a K-12 school district. 
I was born and raised in the projects. Most of my friends are in prison. Some will never get out, but most of them eventually will. It's stories like yours that motivate me to get up and go to work every day. You provide hope for communities like the one that I am from. Every day I go to work and do all I can to convince K through 12 teachers that getting an education is a life or death decision for our students. Um, I think that is a pretty impactful way to um, end this. And thank you, Omar, James, and Alex for sharing your stories and um, being willing to share your thoughts on this. Um, I think it helps all of us understand better what needs to happen and what we need to build. Salima, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your perspectives. Um, we really appreciate that too. And uh, Dr. Solis, as always, thank you for your support of the Higher Education in Prison program. And thank you all of the attendees for showing up tonight and spending some time with us. Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you guys, have a good one. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.